All right, we are live. How's everybody doing? Hope you're doing well out there. Hope you're doing great. Um, I don't know who Frito is, but what's up to everybody in the chat? Shout out to everybody who was here early. Uh, I had to switch the time over. Uh, you know, I just woke up late here from a late night here in Seoul uh, and flipped that over. So we're back in business. I missed my Friday stream because I've been moving here around in Korea. So I'm actually going to be doing a stream today, today's stream, and a stream tomorrow. So you're going to get a Saturday and Sunday stream, which should be pretty cool. I'll do both in the evening around probably this time. I may have time for a morning stream as well. There's been so many topics that literally I do not have enough time to cover them all. I'm picking the ones I like, and this is one that somebody from my locals specifically reached out to me to cover. Excuse me. They live in that area, so they really wanted somebody to cover this topic. Um, hope you guys are all doing well. Nordic Nightmare, you're not that late. We just started here. Um, and yeah, I definitely needed the coffee today. I don't know what it is guys, but today I had to get the big one. It, it needed to happen because I am way, way, way tired from all the moving around I'm doing. Um, computer robots says legal mindset. Hello everyone. Uh, Mr. Esquire, I look for Chris Chrome has been fired from CNN. Oh, that's an interesting one. Okay. So I will look into that. I will look into that for sure. I have not had time to touch it guys. When I, when I find a topic, I have to do a deep dive because I'm not just going to bring you guys surface level stuff. We got to do analysis. We got to go deep. I am not a just a tip type of guy. I go all the way with you guys. Um, coffee is for closers. Well, we're closing here tonight, 90 knots. We're 100% closing. And shout out to 90 knots, one of my OGs here. I love you all. 100 people in the chat. Smash that like button. We're going to get into it here real quick. Um, so let's talk about this Michigan school shooting and what went down there. So I think some basic facts are in order here. We had Ethan Crumbly, who's the actual school shooter, um, who ended up coming out of the bathroom, busting out of the bathroom with a handgun and uh, shooting people in the hallway. He shot four people. He injured numerous others. Um, however, the issue here is not that there was a school shooting. I mean, that's a tragic thing. It's horrible. You know, you, loss of life that way that didn't need to happen. Absolutely tragic, absolutely horrible. But what's more legally interesting in this case is that the parents have now been charged. They've been not only charged, they've been arraigned, right? They've been caught. Um, at one point, they were alleged to have fl fled. So uh, we're going to get into that, and we're going to get into what's going on with the parents. It's extremely rare. It is extraordinarily rare for parents to be charged with any crime when there's a school shooting. In fact, if you think of all the other school shootings, you think of, you know, back to Columbine, Parkland, anywhere else, right? Very rarely have they even thought about it. And even more rarely have they gone and done it, right? It's something that has been maybe a theoretical argument, like, hey, blame the parents, right? Um, and I took a poll here real quick, and I want to see how the poll is turning out on YouTube. Um, but I took a poll on how many people uh, believe that the parents should be held liable uh, for their kids' actions. And right now, it's leading with depends on what happens, but between yes and no, no is in the lead. And no is in the lead. So um, there is a, a bit of a presumption here, and I'll share my screen here so you guys see this real quick. Um, but there's a bit of a presumption on the side of the parents, right? So on the side of the parents, and here's the poll here, um, do you believe in general that parents should be held either criminally or civilly liable for the actions of their children? So yes, 6%, no, 13%, depends on what happens, 74%. So which is the right answer? As a lawyer, the correct answer is always it depends. But what I wanted to gauge was the general sentiment. And of course, 7% of you don't have kids. So <laughs> I mean, look, I'm not going to hate on that in 2021 because there's a lot of stuff to worry about as a parent in 2021. But you know, in terms of general sentiment, I would say more people tend to side on the side of no liability for parents versus yes, absolute liability of parents. So it shows there's a little bit in favor of no liability for parents, simply because we, we say, look, you can be a great parent. You can be a parent who does everything for their kid. And maybe you just have a kid who's, who's fucking crazy, right? Who's doing his own thing, right? Grim's Bar saying it, kids do their own thing. This is why they rebel. Right. There are kids who rebel against their parents. You can be an amazing parent, but the kid is just going to do what the kid is going to do. And there's a period of time where no matter what you say, the kid is going to do something. I remember when I was at that age, when my parents told me something, it was like I would do the exact opposite just because. It was literally because you told me to do that, I'm going to do the exact opposite of what you just told me or find some way to sneakily violate that rule. Right. Because I just want to. I feel like, 
You know, that's just that time of your life. And that's the way you feel as you get older. Obviously you change, obviously you realize some of the stuff you did was, you know, idiotic. I've talked about how I used to play airsoft and paintball trespass on people's property, playing construction sites or, you know, out in like abandoned factories or, uh, you know, in warehouses and stuff like that, you know, pretty dumb. There was one time where I was in an abandoned construction site, I was playing airsoft and I went up to the second floor to get like a good view to scope everybody else out. What I didn't realize was the second floor was unfinished and uh, right below me. Um, now in Miami, you have to construct everything of rebar. And, and the way to do that, you know, to make it hurricane proof is you get, you know, a concrete block and there's a, a, a um, steel uh, pretty much rod inserted in the middle. Well, all the rods had been inserted, but the blocks had not So uh, essentially when you walk up into the second story, you go up the stairs and all of a sudden the floor ends and below are a bunch of rebar spikes. So pretty much I would have been impaled like, um, what's her name? Trinity from the matrix, you know, just absolutely impaled by those rebar spikes. If I'd kept running on the, on the top on the second floor and I came like inches from coming over at that point, I did reevaluate my desire to uh, trespass on construction sites. Um, but you know, you do stuff like that when you're a kid, you know, it doesn't matter whether your parents tell you to, to do it or not. You know, you absolutely break the rules, but in this case, we're talking about a grossly negligent case where the parents could have and probably should have based on the facts that we know so far that are alleged that the prosecutors have brought. And of course, I'll put my Surgeon General's warning here at the beginning is everything is alleged. What happened is horrible. And the facts we have here are horrible. But until they're proven in a court of law, once again, they're not 100% concrete. We're going on the information that we have so far, and I'm taking it at face value so far. So when I say, okay, based on this and this fact, understand these are alleged facts. They have to be proven in court. I think they can be because I think there's enough proof, um, but they need to be shown in court. So let's go over to um, some basic news coverage of this so you guys just see the basics of this background and get some background on this case. So um, here you go. This is just a basic article on this. The parents charged in the Michigan school, sh school shooting are in custody. So prosecutors have filed four involuntary manslaughter charges against the couple whose son is accused of killing four. So each death is an individual involuntary manslaughter charge. So they get a charge for each death, right? Because each death is its own manslaughter. So the parents of the teens accused of killing four students in a shooting in a Michigan high school were taken into custody early Saturday, several hours after a prosecutor filed involuntary manslaughter charges against them. James and Jennifer Cumley were captured in a commercial building in Detroit that housed artwork. Detroit Police Chief James E. White told a news conference, White said the couple were aided in getting into the building and that a person who helped them may also face charges. So they were hiding out, right? Now their attorney, the attorney for, um, or the attorneys uh, for the Crumbleys, had said, no, they're not hiding. They're going to turn themselves in, right? But why did police have to go get them is, is a funny question. So a Detroit business owner spotted a car tied to the Crumbleys in his parking lot late Friday. A woman seen near the vehicle uh, ran away when the business owner called 911. The couple was later located and arrested by Detroit police. So they're accused of failing to intervene on the day of the tragedy, on the day of the shooting, despite being confronted with a drawing and chilling message, blood everywhere that was found on the boy's desk. So this is referencing um, some messages that the school teacher found on Ethan Crumbly's desk. So essentially, Ethan Crumbly was like drawing in class and the teacher, like any teacher does, wanders over and is like, oh, what do you got there, Ethan? And it's a drawing of, I believe... A, um, there's like a stick figure with a handgun and like there was a laughing emoji and like blood everywhere was written on the top. Um, there was also another one that was found that said the voices won't stop or something to that effect. So first of all, this is like signs of severe psychological issues, right? That immediately need to be rectified. So they took um, they took Ethan after they found this to the counselor's office and they said, hey, um, you need to get this guy immediate psychological help. And they were like, okay, that's cool. We'll do it. And the school's like, all right, you have 48 hours, right? Um, and then the parents said, okay, that's fine. But we want our kid to stay in school. We're not pulling him out of school until then. And the school acquiesced to that, allowed the kid to stay. So part of their liability that they're saying here is that they failed to pull him out, right? Failed to pull him out. Now, there's other evidence that has come out as well. There's text messages um, or me other messages on social media um, to their kid that said like something along the lines of, lol, you just have to learn how to not get caught, right? In reference to Ethan getting in trouble with school or, or whatnot, right? Um, 
I think that you know that's a that's a statement that in and of itself by itself is not is not criminal, right? I mean, my dad would say that to me all the time. He'd be like, "Hey, don't get fucking caught." Like, you know what I mean? When when you're doing minor stuff at school, like for example, hitting somebody with like paper taco or whatever else you do in school, you know. For example, I remember I used to play uh, Magic the Gathering in the school cafeteria, right in middle school. And if you were caught, they would take your cards, right? They'd take your Magic cards, your Pokemon cards, your Uno cards, whatever. That that principle, by the way who confiscated those cards could be like probably a millionaire because the value of those cards that he stole has only appreciated. Those are like the original Pokemon cards. So he's got all those and he's got like Urza's like Urza's block from magic, the gathering. So that, that stuff is worth thousands of dollars right now. Um, so anyways, uh, that's neither here nor there. My, my dad would say, yo, don't get caught. Like don't get your stuff stolen. Cause I, I can't get it back. They're not going to give it back to us. Um, so don't, don't get caught. Right. That in and of itself is not a problem. The other thing is, is that, he had access to a handgun. And, and I think the more criminal thing is how he got access to it, how they knew he had access to it, whether they just gave it to him, you know, how much access did they know he was having to that handgun. It's different if, let's say, a student comes back, comes home and, you know, steals something, right? So let's say your dad has a hunting rifle and this kid steals a rifle, right? That's a lot different situation than if you know he has the handgun, he's been using the handgun, he's been posting on social media with the handgun, Right. Um, that's a separate act, right? Which here they qualify as egregious. So the prosecutors say they committed egregious acts from buying a gun on Black Friday and making it available to Ethan Crumbly to resisting his removal at school where they were summoned a few hours before the shooting. So after that counseling session, he proceeded to go back and that's when the shooting happened. So there wasn't 48 hours, this happened immediately. Now the U.S. Marshals had announced a reward of up to 10K for information leading to their arrest. So that's, that's, that's pretty serious. So they, they really thought these people were culpable here. And um, they, the attorney, Shannon Smith, had said the pair left town earlier for their own safety, right? And they would be returning to be arraigned. But when they found they were up, they were appearing to be hiding, right? They were distressed and they had their heads down. Um, it, it's very, very rare for these charges to be brought. And we're going to watch, actually, at the end of this, I want to watch the arrangement. So we get that going um, at the end here. So that being said. <laughs> okay, so speak to your Pokemon cards. I refer first edition originals. Most of the comps aren't worth anything, but any one rare, hollow, or very rare. Yeah, I'm not even sure what I had. I just know that I did have hollows and rares that were first edition, so they could be worth a lot. Could be worth a lot, a lot. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, so that's one uh, huge thing here. Just want to make sure I'm catching up on all the chats. Um, question here. Andrew's live. I just finished the Legal Bites uh, interview with Natalie Wisco. I plan to post on Locals page. Yeah, a lot of good information out there, guys. A lot of the other attorneys are covering really good information. Shout out to my mods in here. and Shout out to everybody in the chat. We're at 215. Uh, love you guys. Smash a like button if you like this topic. Um, and once again, this was coming from my Locals page. Uh, so if you guys don't know, um, I'll just shout out here because I'm going to be um, actually posting a response video to any topic on my locals page. After this stream, I'm going to be going to my locals page and I'll be posting a response video to any topic that is posted there. I'll do an in-depth, you know, response video to anything here. So for example, this one was posted, this remark was actually posted on my last, um, on my last video. And I'm going to go down here and show you guys. Um, I post my response videos about once a week, like roughly approximately once a week. So when I've got these response videos and people go and say, Hey, I'm going to, you know, I want to, I want a specific response. I will come and look at it. In this one in particular, there was a comment that said, I believe, well, I'll find it later, but the comment was asking me to do this one specifically. So that's why I responded. Um, Dark Fox. Somebody don't tell the nose. I live in the same state as him. Oh, of course not. I will not tell Nick at all. Nick is very, very, very culpable. Um, are there any other people here also from Oakland County? I hope there are. I hope there are because this is a big issue and it's a giant issue with the people uh, locally. Locally. So let's go to the charges. Involuntary manslaughter. What is the statute that applies here in this case? Um, the statute that applies is 75321. Uh, it's actually a very simple statute, which simply reads under Michigan law, any person who shall commit the crime of manslaughter uh, shall be guilty of a felony punishable by imprisonment in state prison, not more than 15 years, or a fine of $750 at the discretion of the court. So they can have, be fined and go to prison. Um, I assume they would serve prison time in this case. Now, 
what is the actual elements? Now, the elements are more contained in case law. So there's a secondary site. This is a fine law site. So this is kind of a summary of the elements or the, the basics of involuntary manslaughter. So uh, the code section is 75321. That's what we you know read you right now, which is essentially a criminally negligent homicide, which is an unintentional killing of another person that results from recklessness or criminal negligence or from an unlawful act that is a misdemeanor or low-level felony. So we're talking about an unintentional act, right? Something that is not intentional. They did not do it. So the parents do not need to have actually pulled the trigger. That's what unintentional means. They did not pull the trigger. However, however, was their behavior reckless or criminally negligent? And did that lead to the killing? Did them going out and purchasing the gun on Black Friday, did them giving him access to the weapon, right? Knowingly give him access to the weapon, right? Seeing him post on social media with the weapon, showing that it's a present for him, right? Um, knowing that he could have had the weapon. Did they know it was in his backpack that day, right? Did they know he had that weapon? Did they check his backpack? You know, what duty do they have there? That's something that's got to go to trial. And frankly, those are big issues for parents, right? Do the, the parents have the responsibility to check a kid's backpack every day? Is it criminally negligent if they don't? Or is it only negligent if they know he has access to a firearm, they know he's unstable, right? Because now they've been brought into the counselor's office. They've been told that he literally has pictures in that he's drawing with a gun and a bullet, people bleeding out, blood everywhere, and a laughing emoji, right? At that point, did they have the, you know, responsibility to check his backpack, to pull him out, to immediately get counseling for him, right? Does that rise to that level? That That's a very good question. And it's something that frankly is novel, not just in Michigan, but in the country as a whole. We just are so resistant to holding parents accountable for their children and the things that their children do, you know, and many times you can't control whether or not your child is this type of person. There are people from very normal, average, everyday homes who can turn out to be crazy psychopaths, right? It's, it's always possible, you know, I mean, it's that sort of bad apple thing that sometimes happens. Um, now, I don't know about their background. I don't know about them. I don't know about what type of household they were, you know, don't know that information yet. We will find out that information at trial. So that's the actual statute. Now, let me get to the chat here for a second, um, just to make sure I'm capturing it. I think most of you, let's see one in the chat. If you think this is going to be criminal negligence or recklessness, two in the chat, if you think, no, it's not going to reach that standard. Three in the chat, if you're undecided, if you're completely undecided and you have no clue about whether this would be raising to that level of criminal negligence. So one, guilty, two, not guilty, three, you don't know yet, right? Which is totally okay. Um, most bad seeds are actually just seriously nutritionally de deficient. Yeah, that's, that's true. That's true. And, you know, Andrew, I think the good point, that's a very good point. If you look at the background, you look at what their, you know, diet, you look at their environment, that explains probably 99%, right? 99% of it. But there's always a chance. There's always a possibility that a person, even from a non-nutritionally deficient, you know, household who isn't being neglected, right, can just be a total psychopath. It's possible, right? Uh, we've seen that with affluent killers, right? Anybody who's very affluent and, you know, does it possibly for a different reason, but We'll go there. Uh, we won't go there right now. Brendo uh, with a one. Uh, a lot of ones here. Sassy Gal Beauty uh, there with a one. So it seems like a lot of ones. A couple twos, though. A couple twos. Watching you daily with the two. That's interesting. Um, and some threes. We've got some threes here. So I think the threes are, they were later to respond. But I think that's because they're the ones who are deciding this. And I think perhaps whether or not you're a parent might change your opinion on this. Um, I think as a non-parent, because I'm a non-parent, perhaps sometimes I tend to judge, maybe I judge the the job either being harder or easier than it is, right? Because I don't really know the reality of it. I don't know the reality of trying to deal with the kid 24-7, right? I can imagine some things are very hard. Some things may not be that hard. Some things may be common sense. Um, so it's, it's difficult for me to give an objective opinion on this. Uh, Washington Daily says, shouldn't the school be charged with criminal negligence as well? They were in the same position to stop the shooter. Thank you, Washington Daily. That's a great comment. So there is a there is a legal principle called in loco parentis, and this may apply here. And in this case, they are always they are already talking about holding the school liable. Now that would be 
cataclysmic. Now, it would probably not be criminal liability for the school. It would be civil liability. But we have four deaths here, and there are four wrongful death claims that can come from that. So can the school be liable? Yes. And in fact, if I'm a civil attorney, I am suing the parents and the school because I think that the school had at least a portion of that liability on the school because the school should have procedures. And one of those procedures should be, no, we are not allowing this kid to go back in the class. Hey, maybe let's check his backpack, right? Maybe let's do that, right? Maybe let's do that. You know, I mean, there's got to be some sort of procedures for the school. Now, I'm not saying that they've got to do all these things. I'm not saying these things are all reasonable. But what I'm saying is there's a percentage of the negligence pie. That's how civil negligence works. Not one person is 100% negligent. In fact, um, in most cases, it's a split negligence, right? There's some negligence on one party, some negligence on another. So you're going to have some between the uh, school and some between the parents, a little bit of both. And that's how the civil recovery will happen. That is separate from the criminal process. Although the criminal process going through leads a lot of power to the civil case. So if they're found in this case criminally negligent, then you've got them on the hook on the civil case. That's a slam dunk. And then you've got the school, which you can bring in for the rest. Because the school is going to have the money. You know, the parents, I don't know how much money they make, but they may not have that much money. Um, were the parents at work when the kid got the gun and went to school out of parents control hundred percent? No, they, they, so they went to the school for the counseling session. So they actually got into the school for the counseling session and breathe easy, breathe easy. Thank you so much, man. Thank you so much. Uh, I like you too, buddy. I like you too. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's very, very interesting. So this little binger, bro, this is, this is based, bro. This is some base shit. This is some base shit right here. If you can mandate a kid stay at home with COVID, why not? If he needs psychological help, if he possesses a risk. Well, because the, it's it's important they indoctrinate your kid, right? You know, and they've got to indoctrinate your kid that COVID is the worst thing ever and it's worse than the Black Death and, you know, poverty and diabetes and everything else. And that, that's the only thing you need to worry about in this world is COVID, right? That's very important that they program your kids like that. It is not important. It is not important. Um that they uh, that they deal with kids who can be potential school shooters. Uh, Dylan says, shout out for the super chat. Did you hear that 16-year-old Tate Myers who charged the shooter and saved the lives of the classmates? He's the definition of a Chad Rip goat. Yeah, he looked jacked. I didn't hear the whole story about that, but he looked like a big, big dude. Big dude. Um, very, very big. So, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I believe it. And we need more heroes out there. We need more people who will step up and do that. And if, and if that's the case, that is an actual hero and somebody who deserves to be celebrated, right? Because, you know, somebody, it's like jumping on a grenade, you know? Somebody who takes that for everybody else, that that's that's heroic. That's that's truly heroic. Um, I don't know. Uh, Michael's saying, why the fuck would you want these people to, would you want these people to get charged? Um, the parents? Well, if they were, if the parents are truly negligent, then they should be charged, right? Then they should be charged. Um, so we are going to watch the video arraignment. We're going to do a little watch session here. I have not done this before, guys, so bear with me. And I may pause it a couple times to get you guys' reaction because I just want to make sure I'm doing this right. I want to do more live video reactions because you guys love my reactions. And I haven't watched this whole thing. I just started it and played like a minute or two. I think it's like 20 or 30 minutes. So I think we'll just watch it together um, as soon as I handle the super chat here. Um, but this is the actual arraignment procedures when they're actually bringing them in. So uh, it's already been done. It's pre-recorded. Um, so we'll just be watching it and I'll be breaking down what's going on. There's some interesting interactions during the arraignment. So the parents immediately hired a private attorney, same one that represented Larry Nasser, while their son is left uh, with a court appointed attorney. Well, here's the problem, right? Here's the problem. Um, you got a conflict, right? And we're gonna just we're gonna see this in the arraignment because the 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 lawyers for the parents are actually at the same firm. They they technically have two different lawyers, but they're at the same firm, but they they claim, and we'll see that, and I'm going to stop and pause it, that there's no conflict between the parents. But there sure as hell can be a conflict between the parents and the child in this case, because the child is charged as an adult, right? So he's charged with murder, terrorism, other accounts, right? So at the end of the day, this sounds fucked up, but I'm going to tell it the way it is. The parents, it's best for the parents criminally if their son is held 100% liable. However, in Ethan's case, he will be sentenced more lightly or, or less culpable if the parents were found negligent. So if it was really the parents' fault, 
then he appears less culpable, which maybe only impacts him in sentencing. Maybe that's a lighter sentence for him if it was really a parental bad decision, right? Then they would go lighter on him. But there is a conflict of interest because the shifting of that burden, right? Is it more on the parents? Is it more on the child? That may impact one party versus another. So this is a crazy case where the parents are conflicted with their own child. I mean, imagine being in that scenario. It's a, it's a fucked up scenario. You wouldn't want to be in it. And of course, one could say their own negligence apparently led to this. But that's the situation they've got here where there's a legal conflict between the parents and the child. Um, so that's why they hired a private attorney. And they're going to need they're going to need some good defense to get out of this one. Um, do you think this is another counseling failed the student case legal mindset? Bro, don't even get I don't know. Artifacts, man. I'm, I'm going to tell you some facts here. I, I think a lot of counseling is a hella ineffective. It is really ineffective, like super ineffective. I mean, if we're talking Pokemon, you're, you know, you're trying to hit a you're trying to hit a ghost type with a physical move here. This is not this is not working. You know, uh, most times the, uh, modern day counseling is essentially a band aid. It's essentially just a session where they're there to to mm, I wouldn't even say diagnose. The, it's like taking a Tylenol. You know, you're treating the symptoms, not the cause. Right. There, there's root causes that need more fundamental solutions that have more fundamental solutions than just, OK, let's talk about it, because I'm sorry that we get in this world where we deal with feelings over facts. But the facts of the case are in many cases, somebody mentioned nutrient nutrition and nutritionally deficient kids. Yes, that makes a lot bigger deal how you're raising the kid. Like, are they eating properly? That's going to make a lot bigger deal than do they have somebody to talk to? I mean, what does it matter if you have somebody to talk to if you're starving? Uh, one's in the chat if you guys have heard of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? So one in the chat if you've heard the hierarchy of needs or the pyramid of needs, right? Two in the chat if you have no idea what the fuck I'm talking about, right? So uh, the hierarchy of needs. In this hierarchy of needs, I'll explain it for those twos in the chat um, that have not heard about this. Um, but essentially, the hierarchy of needs goes from basic necessities. We're talking like food, water, shelter, right? And then you get stuff that's a little bit closer, like the, like human connection, right? Like human connection, like social interaction. And then there's like at the top of the pyramid is like fulfillment, right? Like internal fulfillment, right? So, you know, seeking your true purpose in life, that's, a, that's at the top of the pyramid, right? Like seeking your, 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 your life mission, right? That's at the top of the pyramid. But when you don't have things at the bottom, like food, shelter, safety, right? That's going to that's gonna impact the whole thing. It's, your foundation is screwed. It doesn't matter if you put some icing on the top. You're just putting lipstick on a pig, as they would say. You're not actually solving the root issue. And these things have root issues. And I think we're so afraid in our society to criticize people for their parenting methods or say, hey, this is, parenting method is not effective, but we need to come out and say it. We need to stop being scared. Now, look, I'm not the master parent here, but I've certainly listened to a lot of people that say, no, there are objectively wrong and right ways to parent children. There are objective methods that work and things that don't work. I'm not the person who's going to get here and say that, but I think we do need to get down there and say there's objective truths to parenting. There's objective truths that we need to stand by because some things work, some things don't. And there's a reason why in some cultures, practices have been done for so long because they're important. I'm not going to get there right now, but I think that's something that we're getting into today that's uh, it's controversial. It's controversial. Uh, thank you, Nick, for this 199 Super Chat. Appreciate that, brother. Um, and okay, I'm seeing most people knew about the hierarchy of needs. So you guys are familiar with that and know that it, I may have misstated it or summarized it a little bit shortly, but basically that's where we're going, right? Is, um, is that you, you, don't, you can't get to the top if you don't solve the bottom. All right, so let's just do this arraignment thing, guys. Okay, so this is going to be an arraignment. It's going to be a little bit long. Um, not too crazy, but it's going to be a little bit long. Um, this is uh, posted on a secondary site on a news site, local news site. Uh, so I'm going to be streaming it through that. Um, and you guys listen up. I'll check back in every once in a while to explain things and make sure that you guys, um, you know, you guys are getting it, right? So this is going to be the arraignment of the parents. They have already arraigned. They have already charged um, the the child, right? They've already charged Ethan, but this is the actual parents' arraignment. This is from uh, News 4 here. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and play this. Okay. Uh, Mark Keast from the prosecutor's office. Can you hear the court? I can. Thank you, Judge. I can. Jeff Rector from Pretrial Services. Can you hear the court? Yes, Your Honor, I can. Judge Crumbly, can you hear the court? Yes, I can. We're still yes. trying to get James Crumbly set up there. So these are the lawyers. The two women are the lawyers for the Crumblies. This is the mother. This is the father. This is James the prosecutor. Crumbly, can you hear and see the court? Yes. 
Karen McDonald, can you hear and see the court? Good morning, Judge. <clears throat> this is a prosecutor as well. well so these two are um, I'm going to go ahead and call these cases separately. Um, I'm going to call start starting with uh, People versus Jennifer Crumbly, docket number 21006652. Can I have appearances on the record starting with the prosecutor? Karen McDonald on behalf of the people of the state of Michigan. Burke Keast on behalf of the people. Good morning, Your Honor. I'm Shannon Smith on behalf of Jennifer Crumbly. Good morning, Your Honor. Marielle Lehman on behalf of James Crumbly. I do want to address one issue first. Um, Ms. Lehman and Ms. Smith, um, you are practicing in the same firm, is that correct? Your Honor, that's correct. We have spoken to both of our clients about conflicts of interest. We have had in-depth conversations with them. Um, Marielle Lehman and I are representing both of them. We are representing James and Jennifer, and the conflict of interest um, question or issue has been very much discussed and resolved. And we believe at this time, ethically and professionally, we can continue on in this fashion. Okay, well, as you know, pursuant to MCR 6.005 subsection F1, you must state on the record the reasons that you believe joint representation in all probability will not cause a conflict of interest. So please state that for the record in accordance with the court rules. Thank you, Your Honor. After reviewing uh, the circumstances and facts of the case, and um, one of the things I need to make clear is that the media has very much been saturated with cherry-picked facts. But when we have talked to our clients in depth and learned all of the circumstances of the case, which obviously are covered by attorney-client privilege, there is not a conflict of interest between what happened. Without, I cannot divulge to you the specific reasons, but there is not a conflict of interest um, between the parents, their defense, um, and their defense strategy. Um, prosecutor, any uh, comments or statements you wanna make relative to any potential conflicts of interest uh, Your Honor, I, I, you know, I, I'm not sure that there's any facts that have been placed on the record that that meets the standard. I, I'm not saying that I object, but I, I'm not sure that we have um, satisfied the court rule. Um, but I'm, if, if Mr. Keese has something to add, I'm I, I am required to uh, inquire as to each defendant as well. Um, Jennifer Crumbly, do you have any objection to Ms. Lehman and Ms. Smith representing both you and Mr. Crumbly? for this case, recognizing um, that uh, they come from the same firm and they will be representing both of you. I have no objection. That's bad audio. Uh, Mr. Crumbly, likewise for you, do you have any objection to both Ms. Lehman and Ms. Smith representing both you and Ms. Crumbly as it relates to this particular case? No objection, Your Honor. Man, they have horrible mics. Okay, so let me just close this down right, right quick and break down some of the little procedure parts there because that's actually really fascinating. Um, yeah, yeah, that's that's really, really, really fascinating. Um, so essentially, uh, you 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 generally get into situations where one might say, "Oh, it was that guy who bought the gun," right? So, for example, the mom, the mom might say, "Oh, the dad was the one who bought the gun." right? The dad was the one who bought the gun uh, or vice versa, right? I mean, you could say, oh, well, it was the mom who was the lax one. The mom was the, so there's issues here. And a lot of times when giant cases like this happen, guess what happens? A divorce, right? You see a divorce happen in the middle of this that adds some more defense, right? Um, that could add, hey, there was conflict. You know, we disagreed over this. So we're going to divorce. So essentially there's two, there's two ways to go. When you see something like this, you either ride or die or you, you get a divorce pretty much because that's going to say, hey, you're going to split. You're going to say this is adverse. You're going to say, hey, I was, you know, it was them who did it, not me. You know, we had a fundamental disagreement about this. We're going to split up. Right. But it seemed like these are sticking it together. Now, you've got to consent explicitly. So they would have had to sign paperwork saying, I explicitly waive any conflicts between the party. So if one is liable, they're both going to be liable. They're not trying to split their liability here. Now. I understand the defense's argument that they can't divulge any facts. Um, so the prosecutor had said, oh, well, I, I think the rule, the, the Michigan rule, 
requires that you state the facts as to why there are no um, why there are no uh, conflicts, right? Um, but I understand it's attorney-client privilege. It's also defense strategy not to reveal all the facts right up ahead, like right up front. So I get why they didn't state them for the record. It's a very interesting rule. It's probably rarely applied uh, in this case because rarely, are, once again, our parents arrested for something like this. And something like this has a pretty high risk. You need to have a very specific trial strategy for this. Um, which may be adverse to, which definitely will be adverse to Ethan, right? So you might not want to divulge that right away. Um, can you break down the chat simping for the lawyers instead? Oh God. Okay. All right. All right. All right, guys. Wait, who's simping? I did not even see this. Who's simping for, who's simping for these lawyers, right? Oh God. Okay. Here we go. Um, guys, this is not Rakeda's stream. You know, we're, we're simp, we're simp free Saturdays. You know, I'm going to call it simp free Saturdays. Um, we got my, I'm going to label the Sunday one soul Sunday, but it's not simp Sunday guys. So let's just, let's just put it out there right now. Um, however, however, I do think it is smart usually to have, um, I will put this out there though. I will put this out there. This is a fact. It is smart to have attractive lawyers. Uh, here's why I'm going to state this out for the record. Uh, because people in general, it's a cycle psychological. I know once called this the psychology mindset. I do like that, but People generally perceive uh, attractive people more positively. So if you have a corpulent attorney, think of Big Boy. Remember Big Boy from uh, the Rittenhouse case, Kla Kraus, you know, lunchbox, whatever you want to call him. Uh, you know, is there a hot lunch or a cold lunch? You know, he was the epitome of a lawyer that you just have a negative reaction to, right? And, and like FS says, hot people sell stuff. Yeah. And I'm not saying you got to be like, you know, a, a 10 out of 10 here. I'm just saying that it does help. It is helpful, especially when you're in front of a jury or you're in front of people that are going to be judging whether you're right or wrong. Because look, from off rip, you want to make sure that somebody is assessing you positively. If somebody comes in looking disheveled to court, they look like shit, they're in a bad state, no one's going to believe them, right? Right? You just inherently look at somebody who's suited up, who's looking clean, who's freshly shaven, right? And you inherently believe that person versus somebody who comes in, they're disheveled, corpulent, like Kraus. You know, it, it's not going to be a good look. People don't believe you. you. You have a negative reaction to that. Then you have the SDE, that small D energy that Kraus had. And then automatically you become somebody who's not just, who not, don't, you don't just have a baseline disdain for, you hate. Because you see that he has a fragile little ego, the ego of a very tiny person in, in, in that large package. And it is just it is just something that you end up fighting against as a jury, right? It did not do him a service to get angry about it. Um, so that's just one thing. The prosecutor seems likable in this so far, right? She does seem likable um, more than Binger. Did I think Binger was in no way, bro? Uh, you, backdoor Binger? Absolutely not. With his lapel pins? Uh, no way. He was swarmy. He was swarmy. Uh, nobody likes a swarmy dude, right? Nobody likes a swarmy dude. So uh, we're going to go back into this uh, and get into this uh, actual thing here. And uh, we're, we're not, we're going to, we're going to move past the simping and get into the actual charges here in, in a second, guys. So um, this is going to be for both, um, both of the cases as well. Both of the um, defendants, they have to do one and then the other. Okay, let's continue. Do either of you have any questions or concerns about a potential conflict of interest? Mr. Crumbly? No. Ms. Crumbly? No. Okay. At this point, the court is satisfied that um, the both of the defendants um, are comfortable with both attorneys representing them in this case. The attorneys have indicated on the record that they do not believe that there is a conflict of interest and that they have spoken with both defendants in depth relative to any potential conflict of interest and whether or not their representation may jeopardize the right of each defendant to have the undivided loyalty of their lawyers. Therefore, the court will allow them to appear for purposes of the arraignment today um, on behalf of both defendants. Okay, let me cover that real quick because that's actually an important fact there to, to, to knock out. So they just said that they're going to um, they're going to allow them only to represent them today right? Only going to represent them today. So they're not going to, they're not going to agree. The court is not agreeing in perpetuity to allow them to represent them separate, to represent them jointly as a firm. So that's, that's actually pretty critical. So we could see in this trial, we could see that they say, you know what, there is a conflict. So the court is saying that you're going to need to provide facts to show there is no conflict, right? So the court is saying only for the arraignment, are we allowing you to, to be joined, right? That's actually that's actually a very pertinent fact, and small stuff like that can cause a case to uh, to turn. 
Uh, swarmy or smarmy? That's actually interesting. Uh, I haven't heard smarmy. Actually, I think I have heard smarmy. One's in the chat if you prefer swarmy. Two's in the chat for smarmy. So one's for one's for swarmy, two for smarmy, three for binger still a douche. But uh, anyways, regardless, uh, that's actually an interesting one. Um, smash the like for No Sim Saturday. Yes, thank you much, Linda. Thank you much. Um, <laughs> how would how would you like to be married to one of those? Oh my God, I could get into marrying lawyers. Lawyers, that that's a whole separate topic. I've talked about it separately. Uh, so it looks like in my in our poll here, it looks like that we've got the twos uh, seem to be controlling it over swarm. A lot of some ones, so some swarmy, but smarmy seems to be having a lot. And threes, well, I mean, people still do agree. Binger's a douche. So uh, that that is very important. That is very important. Um, <laughs> very very important. All right. So let's get back into it with this, um, and we're going to get past this conflict part because they've now resolved the conflict. Uh, that's totally resolved, and we're going to go ahead with the rest of the arraignment. Thank you, Your Honor. Right. Now, uh, in terms of the arraignment, Jennifer Crumbley, I'm going to arraign you first. So, if you'll please make sure you get close to that microphone so that we can hear you. These if at any time you cannot hear or see me, please put your hand up. We will stop the proceedings and then try to figure out what's going on. Do you understand that you are charged with the following counts? Count one, involuntary manslaughter, which is punishable by up to 15 years in prison and or up to a $7,500 fine and mandatory DNA for the death of Madison Baldwin. Do you understand that, Gerald? Do you understand that that is a charge for count one? Mr. Crumbly, you need to, you need to further I, respond. I understand. Do you understand that you are charged in count two for the death of Tate Meyer? Involuntary manslaughter, which is punishable by up to 15 years in prison and or up to a $7,500 fine and mandatory DNA. I understand. I understand. Do you understand that you are charged in count three for the death of Hannah St. Juliana? with involuntary manslaughter, which is punishable by up to 15 years in prison and or up to a $7,500 fine, along with mandatory DNA. With involuntary manslaughter, which is punishable by up to 15 years in prison and or up to $7,500 fine, along with mandatory DNA testing. Do you understand that you do have the right to plead guilty or not guilty to all those counts? I understand. And do you understand that you do have a right to a trial, either by jury or by judge? And at that trial, you would have the opportunity to call witnesses on your behalf, confront witnesses that have been called against you, and or to remain silent, and that you'd be presumed innocent to proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Do you understand all those trial rights? Yes, Your Honor. So let me let me break that down for you real quick, uh, guys, because that's so this is part of the arraignment process. And it's important you guys understand this is part of your due process rights. So you have your due process rights that ensure a speedy trial, right? But also a fair trial, right? Part of the thing that I believe in in our justice system is that there is still a rule of law and you still have to have, regardless of whether you're guilty or innocent, regardless of whether you've committed the most minor crime or the most heinous crime, you have the right to know the charges against you, right? To know what is being brought against you. So no ambush, right? You can't have something you don't understand. So the judge is saying, do you understand we're charging you with this specific crime? Right, not a different crime, not a ridiculous crime. This is the specific crime. You have to say yes or no. You have to say I understand. Right, that's part of it. The arraignment is acknowledging that part of due process. Is saying, hey, do you understand this? Yes, I understand that. Do you understand that you have the right to declare guilty or not guilty? It's not your attorney, because a lot of times these attorneys, including the prosecutors, will assert that oh, you have to do this, you have to plead guilty, you have to plead guilty. Right? No, you don't. No, you don't right? You could always say, hey, I want to do not guilty, right? Your defense attorney may say, the defense attorney may say, uh, oh, you you can you can just go and plead guilty. It'll be fine, right? Uh, or, or, oh, you have to plead guilty here because if you don't, if you don't take a plea deal right now, then you're going to be screwed. Well, no, you don't. You can always go to trial. You can always say you're not guilty, right? You can always say, I plead not guilty, right? That's your personal decision. Only you make that decision, right? Um, and if you were to say, oh, guilty, then it goes, then it automatically goes to the next step. Okay, then it go, going to sentencing, right? And if there's some sort of deal struck, then okay, then you can go into, okay, what was the deal? What was the plea deal, right? 
Uh, and that's what a plea deal is about. A plea deal is, hey, if you plead to this, we will give you X, right? So if you plead to the 15 years, right? If you plead guilty, we're not going to give you 15 years. We'll give you six months, right? You've just got to plead guilty to that. Um, that's the example of a plea deal. So Alex has 15 years in prison or and or $7,500. I don't see how 15 k is 15 years equals 7.5K. They always get applied together. Generally, Alec, they do. Generally, they do. It's usually generally an and. It's not an or, right? So they almost never just give the fine in this case. This is not a case where they're getting the fine, right? Why do they add the fine? Because they want to make sure that even if they're sentenced very lightly, right? Even if the judge was a sentence, I'm very lightly that there's some sort of like, and one, like, okay, you're going to get the fine too. Um, even if the prison sentence is light, they're going to hit with the fine. Also, you got to understand too, that 7.5 K, a lot of these statutes haven't been updated in decades. So sometimes that 7.5 K has been in there since the eighties or maybe the seventies. Hey, 7.5 K was a lot more in the 1970s, right? Um, so sometimes these amounts haven't been updated. Sometimes they have, a lot of times they have, but sometimes they haven't. So, I mean, you could argue that some of them might need to be updated, but they try to include both penalties and typically they hit them with both, right? They're going to be hit with both. Um, but that's actually um, good here. Um, John says lots of prosecutorial misconduct here. Uh, I, I don't know what we're talking about with prosecutorial mis misconduct. Um, I would like to see that. John, if you've got um, evidence of that or you want to see what exactly you think is prosecutorial misconduct, let me know, bros. Let me know. Um, yeah, smash the light, you bigots. Love it, love it, love it. And thank you, Lana. Good to see you as well. Good to see all you guys. Um, here on a Saturday PM. We're just chilling and watching this arraignment. So uh, let's go back here. I think I caught all of the comments here. So we'll go back here and catch the rest of this arraignment. Once again, we've gotten past the file. We've gotten past the charges and we're going once again, charge by charge because each death is an individual charge, right? So each one is an individual charge. Are you on probation or parole for any other offense? Hold on one second. I'm gonna I'm gonna fast forward here uh, for a second, guys, because this one is actually a little um, the audio a little the, sucks a little bit. So let me fast forward here again. Um, make sure this audio is good. Okay, got it. Ma'am, I'll ask the question again. Are you on probation or parole no. for any offense? No. Okay, so this this clips a little bit, like the audio clips here. Is, How are you there you go. Not guilty. So she's pled. The so the person, audio was clipping. For you but for all four counts. Um, the court will set the probable cause conference, which is going to be on December 14th. Uh, Amy, what time did we have that one? So she she pled guilty to all four counts, right? She pled guilty to all four counts um, of uh, involved, uh, not guilty, sorry, not guilty for all four. And then what happens is this is the original arraignment. This is when they're charged, but there is has to be a probable cause conference because in order to hold them, they have to have probable cause. So they've got to have that conference, um, that motion very quickly. So if they're discussing the date for that because there are guidelines. Uh, that is December 14th at 1.15 p.m. December 14th. The preliminary 14th. examination is scheduled for December 22nd at 9.45 a.m. Those will be in-person hearings. Your Honor, um, just as a matter for our file, are you assigned for the purpose of exam in the pre-exam, or is it, a, is it a different judge within the court? It is me. The okay, perfect. Sorry, Perfect. Please. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to address bond in a minute. I'm going to go ahead and um, arraign Mr. James Crompley first. Mr. Thank James Crompley, see, see and hear the court will pay. Yes. And do you understand, sir, that you are charged um, in count one for the death of Madison Baldwin of involuntary manslaughter, which is punishable by up to 15 years in prison and or to a $7,500 fine and mandatory DNA testing? I understand. Do you understand in count two, you are charged with the death of Tate Meyer for the involuntary manslaughter, which is punishable by up to 15 years in prison and up to a $7,500 fine and mandatory DNA testing. I understand. Do you understand that you are charged in count three for the death of Hannah St. Juliana um, with the involuntary manslaughter, which is punishable by up to 15 years in prison and up to a $7,500 fine and mandatory DNA testing? 
understand. And do you understand that you are charged to account for for the death of Justin Schilling, um, involuntary manslaughter, which is punishable by up to 15 years in prison and up to a $7,500 fine and mandatory DNA testing? I understand. Do you understand that you do have the right to plead either guilty or not guilty to all of those charges? I understand. Do you understand you have a right to a trial either by jury or by judge? And at that trial, you would have the opportunity to call witnesses on your behalf, confront witnesses that have been called against you and or to remain silent, and that you'd be presumed um, not guilty until proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt for each and every element of the crime. Do you understand those trial rights? I understand. Are you on probation or parole for any other offense? No. How are you pleading to count one? Not guilty. How are you pleading to count two? Not guilty. How are you pleading to count three? Not guilty. And how are you pleading to count four? Not guilty. Okay, I'm going to say one thing real quick, which is uh, those microphones in the court seem to be trash because he sounds very robotic, very inhuman when he's saying the the not guilty. Now, if that's his actual voice, then then I'd be shocked. But it seems like it's the mic. I, I've heard bad mics before. I used to have some bad mics when I first started my channel. Um, so I think it's just a really trash, cheap public government mic. But he sounds really bad. Uh, it doesn't sound bad. He sounds very kind of robotic and, 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 you know, it's, it's a very unnatural sound. So let me just say that right now. One other thing I'll say too, is you got to understand that they each have to go through this process because they're each individuals, even if they'll be represented by the same team, the same firm, right? Even if they realize that their fates are tied, right? They have to individually, because these crimes apply to them individually, they have to individually go through their trial rights, right? So that's an important thing to consider. Again, the court will accept the plea of uh, not guilty for all four counts. This your case will also be scheduled for a probable cause conference on December 14th at 1.15 and a preliminary examination on December 22nd at 9.45 a.m. At this point, I'm going to address bond. Um, first, I'd like to hear from pretrial services. So this is an argument. Thank you, Your Honor. Jeffrey Wright. Okay, so now they're going to discuss bond. So actually, let me let me uh, stop this pause this here, guys, and see if you have any questions before we go into bond. Because bond is a whole different animal, right? Bond is a, a much different animal because uh, bond is whether or not they get out. Now, I don't know Michigan law. I actually have to look into this. This was a big issue with the Wakesha, uh, you know, car attack, the hate crime, as I call it, uh, the, the terrorist attack, certainly terrorism for sure, uh, in Wakesha was everybody was pissed that this guy got out on bond, ready, got on a bond. However, um, the issue is, is that in some states, they require you to offer bail. You require you to offer that as an option. So we're going to go into that right now. It's going to start. Actually, I, I don't even know what they, what they ended up coming down to here, where there's no bomb, whether a flight risk, they're going to go into that analysis now, I believe. So we're going to see that. And this is new for me. So I don't even, I haven't even seen this part of the arraignment. So you're going to see my like fresh reaction on this. Cause I have not watched this part of the video at all. Um, to answer this question, your marshal said, would they serve the sentences consecutively or concurrently? Um, it, it's, it's typically concurrently, it's simply concurrently. Um, you know, and also they're going to get credit for time served to the extent that they're in jail versus out. So they would get some credit for that and have some time off there. Parents get too much blame. This is from Nick. Thank you so much. Parents get too much blame for bad kids and too much credit for good ones. My paternal twins are opposites and both better than my parenting skill. <laughs> oh, hey, Nick, that, thank you for that comment. Thank you for that comment. I, this is, I think, what I wanted to get to, Nick. And I think what you were saying is what I was trying to say. But as a parent, a non-parent, as a completely single dude who constantly meets people that are younger than me with kids that, you know, are in middle school and it kind of scares the shit out of me. Um it's, it's, you know, a, a good point, a fair point is that you blame the parents when things go wrong and you congratulate them when things go right. Right. And sometimes it's like, okay, well you contributed, but how much, right? How much is it on that kid? How much is in their discipline? How much is it into the other factors the school, their teachers? So yeah, I do agree with that. Um, I think it's hard to get it perfect, right? It's hard to get that baby bear level, you know, not too hard, not too soft. You know, um, it, it's very, very difficult to get there. Uh, but I do appreciate that comment because it's good coming from someone who is a parent, right? According to Rakeda on Pool's show, Wisconsin, where Wakush is, requires the entire bond amount to be deposited, no bondsman or part payments. Well, that, that that's intense, right? That's intense. And I get that. Um, yeah, I get that. So I, uh, I I bet no low or zero bail for Whitey. Yeah, uh, we'll see. We'll see what it is. I, I wouldn't think so either. I wouldn't think so either. Um, we'll see, though. We'll see. 
um, it's uh, it's unlikely to be a you know fifty dollar bond or a one thousand dollar bond or two thousand dollar bond. Um, in this case, there's a plenty of apparent culpability. Otherwise, Nick's statement is generally agreeable. Okay, yeah, I mean that's that's very very fair. Uh, can you buy your kid a rifle under a trust contract? That means use it, but you need to have it locked away. Yeah, I mean, you can. You can form a gun trust, right, by buying your kid a rifle or a gun and keeping it in trust for them, right? Um, the angry mother um, reportedly texted, um, lol, I'm not mad at you either. You just have to learn not to get caught. Yes, this is what I was talking about earlier. This is a text message. Now, here's my comment, Tweety. This, this statement, this statement right here, lol, I'm not mad at you. You just have to learn to get caught when he was searching for ammo, like, okay, well, maybe ammo is, is, uh, maybe ammo is something, yeah, he shouldn't be searching for. Right. But just saying, oh, don't get caught. That's something a lot of parents say. I mean, like I said, my dad said it. The question is, is that my dad was saying it in reference to like, I don't know, skipping school or, you know, oh, I got, I got in trouble with the cops once for uh, lighting off illegal fireworks in Miami. We had bought in fireworks on the way back from North Carolina. We used to go up to the mountains every summer because it's cool there while it's hot as a witch's tit in Miami, Florida. The humidity just pours out of your body. Um, it is, uh, it, it is, it is ridiculous uh, that you can't use a lot of types of fireworks in Miami. You can't shoot anything that goes in the air, anything, even like a small little bottle rocket is not permitted in Miami-Dade County, particularly in the part of the county where I lived. It was extreme no-no and we had a lot of board cops. So we had those mortars that we bought in South Carolina at Phantom Fireworks right uh, on the border there. Um, or was it Georgia? It was either South Carolina or Georgia, but uh, I think it might've actually been Georgia. Anyways, point of the matter was, is that we bought those fireworks, uh, right on the border, brought them back into Florida, brought them into Miami-Dade County. And I was launching off those mortars. They were awesome. They were huge. They were, they looked so cool. However, the crotchety old neighbors called the cops on me, you know? And then when I get caught, I, my dad came out and he's like, oh, this is horrible. I'm going to lock these kids up forever. Don't worry, police. I got it. And of course they let you right go. They let you go. Right. And my dad said right after, Hey, don't get caught next time. You know, uh, which I'm like, all right, duly noted, right? But this isn't me searching for ammo for my handgun, right? I mean, it's a much different situation, right? So that statement in and of itself is uh, is a different thing. So South Carolina has Phantom fireworks. I'm in Georgia. Okay, so it was either it was either Phantom or another one, but I believe it was Phantom. I believe it was Phantom. Um, yeah, and you can know what I'm talking about: the artillery shells, the ones you drop in the tube and launch off like a like a mortar. Um, yeah. I search for ammo in my law classes all the time. What's the big deal? It's dry out there. Look, it's different if you're underage. It's different in, in there if you're underage. Uh, so let's get into the bond, guys. Let's see what they let's see what the judge says about bond for these guys because this is a big, big issue, and this is becoming more and more controversial. So we're going to get into it right pre -trial now. Pre-trial services. Uh, Ms. Gardner declined to speak with pre-trial services and respect and request to speak with her attorney. As a result, no references were contacted and little background information is available. She's 43 years old and married. Her listed address with the jail is 112 East Street in Oxford, Michigan. Uh, she does not have any, she does have a prior criminal history. Uh, she uh, is not currently on probation or parole. She does not have a history of failing to appear. She does not have a prior documented history of violence. Uh, the charges against the defendant are severe and are those charges uh, issued by the court and along with the co-defendant failed to turn themselves into authorities well every defendant is afforded the presumption of innocence the purpose of bail is to ensure appearance and the safety of the community uh, defendants in this matter had agreed through their attorney to turn themselves in to the court once charges were issued on 12 3 of 21 however instead they fled based on the defendant's attempt to flee prosecution pretrial services has concerns for appearance and the safety of the public it is our recommendation that a release on recognizance bail is not appropriate in this case. Uh, in order to further mitigate concerns for appearance of public safety, if the defendant makes release, the following conditions are respectfully recommended. Pretrial services supervision, the GPS tethered prior to release, allowed to leave home for work if employed, medical appointments, attorney visits, uh, not to have any contact with any witnesses, victims, or return to Oxford High School, not to possess a firearm, and uh, must turn any firearms in that have not been confiscated. Okay, so let me break that down for you real quick, what they asked for. So 
they they didn't ask for a specific amount there. What they asked for was, uh, and let me let me be very clear what what went down because there's a lot of facts in there and a lot of things that I want you guys to understand. Because this part of the process is very important for you guys to understand. So release on recognizance. That's usually referred to in the community as an ROR, right? Release on your own recognizance. People will just use the slang ROR. So oh, these guys were ROR. That means pretty much that you're released on your promise to come back, right? Now, if you have no criminal history and you have no reason you're going to run away from a crime, right? If you're like a guy who's in the community working, you have a job, you're employed, you know, let's say you're a doctor, right? And you're arrested for a DUI, which happens all the time, right? And, you know, you're just like, this is your first charge, whatever. They're probably going to ROR you because there's no way that you're like, it's very unlikely. You're, you don't have a prior criminal history. You have a job. You're going to go out there. You know, you have a, maybe you have a family, right? You know, you have a wife, you have kids, whatever, you know, that's going to, uh, it's going to appear like, Hey, here's your residence. You're not somebody who's a, who's a, a drifter, right? Who's staying in a hotel, who's from out of town, who's going to be running away from the trial. It's, are you a flight risk? Are you going to run away from trial? Are you not going to show up? Now they do bring up safety of the community, but there's nothing here that shows that they are a risk to the actual community other than through their negligence towards Ethan. So uh, what the what they asked for was a GPS tether. What that is, is what you guys know is an ankle bracelet, right? Um, <laughs> I like Tweety. She uses the word RAR. Yes, uh, R-O-R typically. Um, but uh, but yes, it's actually just a GPS tether is an ankle bracelet. So they're going to strap them with an ankle bracelet. They're going to monitor them. They're going to say, hey, you can't contact anybody. And by the way, guys, they're going to turn in all their firearms, right? And for all you 2A people out there, right? So shout out to my 2A people. If you love the Second Amendment, one's in the chat. If you're a dirty commie who hates guns, two in the chat, right? But one in the chat for all my firearm lovers out there. Um, so this is what I talk about when I talk about how they get people's guns, guys. A lot of people don't realize how they get people's guns. Um, how you, okay, wow. Explosion of ones. Okay, explosion of ones. Um, yeah, that's what I like to see. Everybody here on the one side. Nice, uh, nice thumbnail there. Havoc. I love that. I love that. Um, I can't do it. I can't do it. The, the accent like Nick can, but, uh, I can try ha Havoc. No, that, that's it. Uh, that's as good as I'm going to get. Um, Oh, we got one dirty commie in the chat. Oh, Gilbert, Gilbert. It's okay. I, I, uh, I will accept you. Uh, you can come visit me here in Korea. I will push you across the DMZ. Uh, very gently, very gently. Um, two A equals one. Yes. Two A equals one. Because uh, 2A should be the number one thought right now because it's what they're going to try to take away. So this is why I talk about, guys, I get worked up about these red flag laws. I get worked up about these backdoor ways, just like Binger tries to bring backdoor evidence. These backdoor ways, they try to take your guns, right? And look, this is an egregious case. This is a case where they should absolutely, um, they should absolutely uh, take any weapons away. I get it in this particular case. However, there's other cases. There's other cases for other charges where you can get your weapons taken away. You can get your weapons confiscated, even for charges that are not necessarily violent, right? So let's say, for example, you know, there's uh, some other sort of charges, a fraud charge, right? You could have a condition that your guns are taken away. And, and once again, <sighs> I think we see when we think of a uh, second amendment, we think of people passing laws that say guns are banned. Machine guns are banned. AR 15s are banned. Anything that looks scary is banned, right? Big, you know, clips are banned. Magazines over 10 rounds are banned. We think of direct attacks, but I am telling you guys that the death by a thousand cuts is these separate laws that enable police, enable people to take your guns without you knowing it. I think there should be strong protections for that, just as strong as we protect freedom of speech and due process, um, because the Second Amendment is that important, right? Is, is that important. Uh, now, if there's actual threat of harm, I get that, right? But you should have to prove that. You should have to substantiate that. Um, and it definitely is leading to tyrannical governments. You can see Australia and what they're doing in Australia. It's gotten to uh, literally clown world out in Australia. Um, and I agree with Proteus here, shall not be infringed is a strong dictate, is a very, very strong dictate. Um, 100%. And of all the law tubers, I think I'm the strongest. I'm just going to call it out there. Like, I think we should expand self-defense. I think we should expand our ability to carry the weapons. I think we should expand our ability to not have them taken away from us, right? Just because, for example, I am I get crazy that there are states right now where somebody you are just dating 
right? Your Tinder date, you meet for once or twice. They can say, oh, that person is a threat. I'm scared for my life because they have guns. And there are states where that is good enough for the police to kick down your door and take all your weapons, right? Just because, you know, she got salty that, uh, you know, she catfished you and you weren't okay with it. I don't know. I mean, whatever. I mean, it's getting to that point in some states where the law is at, where somebody who's just going out with you, you know, can make that accusation. It's very, very scary, guys. It's getting scary with these red flag laws and the enforcement of these red flag laws, right? So it's, uh, yeah, it's something that I really am concerned about around the U.S. Now, there are some jurisdictions, some based ass jurisdictions that are passing anti-red flag laws that do not allow things to be taken in that circumstance. Um, but, uh, but yeah, outnumber mom says more of the story. Don't Tinder date. Well, that's, that's a good point there. That's a good point there. Um, Marilyn says, I disagree on one of those points. Well, let me know what you disagree with and I'll try to try to cover it here, um, or slide it into a comment and I'll try to get it later, but let's go back to this and see what the judge has to say and what the actual outcome is of the, of the bail hearing. So, uh, here we go. Thank you. Um, who is going to speak on behalf of the prosecutor's office? I am, Your Honor. Go ahead. Your Honor, I, I'm sure you've read the swear to you. Um, pursuant to MCR 6.106, a bond should be set with the considerations of the likelihood of conviction first. Here, the likelihood of conviction is strong. Your Honor, uh, we know from the facts and that were presented at the swear to you that uh, the Crumbleys, Mr. Crumbley, purchased this weapon for his son um, and that on the 27th, the, the uh, Mrs. Crumbly went to the shooting range with her son, posted on social media saying that it was a mother Sunday and that she was um, she bought a weapon for her, a, a gun for her baby for Christmas. OK, I'm going to stop that there real quick. OK, so let me call some shit out right now. Let me let me call some shit out right now. I don't like this. I don't like this. Uh, actually, you know what? I'm going to even pull the. Now I'm going to leave it here for a second. I'm not going to go full. Actually, I will go full screen on this. Fuck it. I'm, I'm, this pisses me off. All right. All right. This pisses me off. All right. I do not like. This is how. This is how. This is how anti any infringement on the 2 a.m. I am. This woman, this prosecutor, is daring to say, as evidence for substantial likelihood of criminal negligence, of criminal negligence, that it is wrong. To go to in Marylander, yes, you can tag me in a video response. You can always tag me in a video response. You can tweet at me on YouTube, and I will definitely 100% respond. Um, and if you go to my locals and post there, I will respond to you as well. I'm doing that after this. Anything on my locals, if you post anything on my locals, you comment on my locals, I will be responding after this stream. As soon as the stream is over, I'm going on to that, and I'm looking what's posted on my locals, legalmindset.locals.com. Okay. It is infuriating infuriating for them to insinuate that you buying your son a gun if you're as long as you're with your child you can own a gun you can absolutely 100 own a gun i was hunting at age like 12 you know i was going to skeet shooting at like age 10 you know i learned how to safely use a weapon with my dad with my uncle they taught me gun safety and i think it's so important to learn that it doesn't matter if you learn it at a young age as long as you're safe we were hella safe hella safe my brothers were learning it even younger than me. My brothers were learning to shoot even younger than I was, right? I don't see a problem with that. I think it's un-American to use as evidence for likelihood of conviction that they went to a range together. That is disgusting. I don't like it. And it's bad for the Second Amendment. It's bad for the Second Amendment. She should per se not be allowed to offer that as evidence of, of uh, criminality, right? Other evidence I'm okay with, right? Because then we can debate the other evidence. But just saying that because she did that alone, that's enough? No. But this is how crazy woke we've gotten in America. We've gotten so crazy in America that literally just having the gun is being perceived as a negative thing. Look at the look at the uh, Kyle Karth and Chad Reed incident in Lubbock, Texas. We have people, including lawyers. These are lawyers. There are lawyers out there, right, that are saying, oh, their gut reaction until they looked at the law and they realized they were wrong, right? Their gut reaction was, oh, it's provocation for him to bring a gun, you know, to, to have a gun in his house. It's like, no, that's not provocation. I'm sorry. You guys have been so brainwashed that you think anytime you see a gun, oh my God, gun scary, gun bad. Oh no, you have fallen into the trap. I don't care how supposedly based you are, right? If you think that just the possession of a gun is a problem, and using it in a legally permitted way is a problem, you're not a Second Amendment lover. You're anti-Second Amendment, right? And this is a, if you're not with it, you're against it because you're falling into the frame of the woke Marxists that want to strip away our gun rights, that want to restrict our gun rights. We need to expand them, not restrict them. 
right? This is the problem with this, right? Uh, Tracy says, would love your thoughts on the, having select teachers obtaining concealed carry. I am pro this. In fact, I'm pro anybody with a concealed carry being able to carry in school. I, I said it. I said it. I think if you've got a concealed carry and you're a teacher, you shouldn't have to get an additional license. You should just be able to. Do that. It's fundamental to their rights. Right. And sorry if the Internet flickered here real quick. Um, sometimes, you know. Uh, South Korea, they try to hack me. You know, Kim Jong-un gets up on me when I get worked up. Uh, I'm sorry, Kim. Um, I will not be doubting the glorious uh, Democratic People's Republic of North Korea anytime. Uh, I, I'm still I'm still behaving here in Seoul. Still behaving. I'm infiltrating for you, Kim. I got you, bro. Um, all right. Uh, so sorry I got worked up on that, guys, but I just get I get absolutely absolutely worked up on that. And yeah, making it required for teachers. Look, I don't believe that you should be able to force them, but I think they should, if they want to, they should be able to go and they should be able to, uh, they should be able to absolutely get it and carry it in school, right? You should be, I think the more people that are carrying the better, the more that, the more people that are able to do it. Fuck that. Fuck the teachers, the janitor, bro. I want Willie from the Simpsons to be packing heat, you know, because that's the person who's going to come and take them out. Right. I believe the base ass janitor is going to like neutralize this threat very quickly. Right. A teacher could have neutralized this threat. The janitor could have the, the hall monitor. Right. Whoever's whoever's out there who's an adult who's licensed to carry. Let him carry. Right. The best way to stop a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. Right. Um, <laughs> Dear leader Trump says, hi, Kim. I love the Trump and Kim Jong Un photos. Those actually make me laugh, honestly. Um, and the memes too, the memes as well. Um, but anyways, guys, we're going to go back here because. This worked me up. I get kind of pissed off with some anti-2A arguments, and this is more. You're going to hear more from this woke-ass prosecutor. Oh, Carter with a $5 super chat. I believe there's a bill that is going to be introduced to allow teachers to conceal carry in Michigan. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that'd be awesome. That'd be totally awesome. Uh, Joe says, how is it not provocation when he didn't have the gun to start the argument and retrieved it in the middle of the argument? Okay, Joe. Now, let me explain this very clearly, and I, and I appreciate that you put it in the form of a super chat, and I appreciate that you asked it respect re respectfully. Um you are allowed to possess a weapon on your property regardless of the, the circumstances, right? So he was on his property. He was in both his habitation and his uh, place of work. So under Texas law, it was legal for him to possess a weapon regardless of the circumstance. So whether or not he was in a fight, cooking pie, oh, God damn it. Uh, you could be in the kitchen cooking pie with a handgun, right? Um, you can be anywhere at any time with a gun. It is totally fine under Michigan law. You're totally allowed under Michigan, or sorry, not Michigan law, Texas law, uh, which was applicable in the Kyle Carth and um, Chad Reed case. Um, you're allowed to have a gun at the time. So you can't treat that as per se. Um, you cannot treat that as per se provocation. Um, and sorry about that, guys. I think the I think the internet's flickered a little bit. I know what's going on here, but it is what uh, it is. Susan and North Korea, guys. Um, <laughs> so f, f in the chat for Susan and North Korea. Um, yeah, yeah. So I do believe in constitutional carry, and I do believe people should be allowed to carry whenever they want, wherever they want. Right. So I heard the argument that owning a gun in and of itself isn't a constitutional right. Thoughts? That's a lie. That's that's a straight up ball face lie. Um, you have the right to own a gun. That has been established under the U.S. Constitution. Period. Hands down. That's it. You are allowed to own a gun under the Constitution. Um, Fifteen dollars super chat here says teachers are too scared to tell the parents uh, their kid is crazy. Parents don't want to hear that their kid is crazy. Yes, 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 yes. Um, parents are are afraid and a lot of times here's the other thing too i've heard about it from the teachers the teachers are afraid of the parents this is where we've gotten we've gotten into a world that the parents have more control than the teachers the teachers just view themselves as these helpless people that are going to get fired they're going to get punished if they stand up to the parents well no they've got to have some brass cojones and say no we're, we're we're drawing a line here i'm not having this kid in my class you know he, he's not allowed to be in my class but the public school system is so is so programmed and so, you know, blue pilled that it's hard to break into that. And it's hard to make changes, especially in the public school system, which is why so many people are leaving it. And which is why when they're trying to teach CRT to your kids, when they're trying to teach all this other woke shit to your kids, you say, okay, maybe it's time to pull your kids out of public school and either, you know, find a private school that works for you, a charter school that works, 
or homeschool, you know, or life school, right? You know, uh, because school is becoming something that is becoming increasingly and increasingly useless uh, in the modern era. I, I am very against college. And even I talk people a lot about going to law school. I will be doing a video on what you should do if you want to do a law school. I'll be either doing that um, tomorrow or, or sometime later this week um, because I know I've had a lot of people ask for it. But a lot of times I'll talk people out of school because it's so problematic and because you're not getting an environment where people are giving the facts, Dr. Spoon. And that that's the problem here. They're too worried about people's opinions, not their facts. Um, it sounds like you and Bronca, um, I saw somebody say, it sounds like you and Bronca are aligned on the Second Amendment. Do you agree with his take on automatic firearms? I haven't heard that one. I think that automatic firearms should be legal. Uh, I'm going to say it. I don't think you need, I don't think you need to uh, apply for a license for them. Fuck it. I think the military can have them and we can have them. Um, and I think that there's some situation, some situations where for self-defense, you would need an automatic weapon, right? Um, where it would help to have an automatic weapon. I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. Um, Ken Deasy, I know a lot of people say, oh, I wish I went. I wish I didn't go. I'll, I'll give you the real, real, especially when I talk about it, which, especially when I talk about having a plan and what the market is really like, right? What it's really, really, really like. Um, Tuna says that's his take as well. Okay, great, great. Um, I think this should be legal. Shit. Uh, I saw somebody saying uh, legalize civilian tanks, and I'm like, you know what? Under certain circumstances, I might be all right with that. I have to like think about tanks, but I'm like, you know what? Let me think about that. Like the same thing with like owning a private cannon, right? You know, were were, were cannons allowed in the back of the day? Mm, okay. Well, there, there's other concerns. Like I get it, um, but I'm willing to entertain the argument. Is what I'm saying. A lot of people aren't willing to entertain the argument. I'm like, oh, I'll hear it out. Like I'll hear it out. Let's let's hear out that argument, right? Um, but I think automatic weapons for sure. Right. For, for sure. I'm um, saying my dad had, a, had an automatic firearm license during the Clinton ban. Crazy, crazy. Um, you pretty much just need the money, right? So it's just money plus 200 bucks. Okay. Well, I think there's a stamp though, right? There's a stamp um, that you need to get for that, which essentially requires an application. Uh, Panzer parking only. Yes. Panzer parking only. Yeah. You can, uh, yeah. So as people yelling, cannons are not firearms. Cannons are not regulated as firearms anymore. Oh, okay. Cool. 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 See, I didn't know that. You got to teach me. Look, you're, you're schooled up. You're schooling me. Um, yeah, Mc, <laughs> McNukes. Yeah, <laughs> that would be interesting. You to get your McNukes. Uh, Phoenix says, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Sure sounds like the right to own guns to me. When the Second Amendment was written, it was common for people to have military great weapons, and we should today. Yes, I, I agree with this statement. I agree with this statement. I, I, Phoenix, I got no objections here, bro. Like, if, if we were allowed to have what the military had, we had muskets, you know, you're allowed to have muskets. You're allowed to, you know, do... Uh, you know, have whatever the military had back in the day. And then we should apply that today. I mean, look, if you've got the money to own a fighter jet, well, fuck it. You own a fighter jet now, right? I mean, you're going to have to pay for it. But uh, if you're able to pay for it and construct it, then why not? That's the same thing I feel about like civilian, uh, you know, spaceships and shit, right? You know, you should be allowed to build your own spaceport. And if you want to launch out to launch out to Mercury, you know, or do whatever the fuck you want to do, go do it, right? I believe in that. Um, but once again, that might be my liberty mindset. And part of the legal mindset is being your own judge. And I think you should, part of being your own judge, my philosophy is being in control of your own, of your own self, your life, your property, your liberty, right? Uh, so nuclear subs too. If you have the money, once again, these are very expensive things to get, but if you have the money, why not? I think it would be interesting. Um, my mom said back in the day, 60s, her principal had a ruler all the way to a baseball bat on the wall. You leveled up each time you got in trouble. Yeah. Some people deserve the ruler and some people deserve the baseball bat. I'm just going to say, I'm just going to say, um, and look, corporal punishment. This is a fun fact, Tracy. In a lot of States, corporal punishment is still technically legal, uh, in a lot of States in school. So schools in some States are still allowed to enact corporal punishment. They're still allowed to physically punish students. They just don't anymore. Cause they're so afraid of the parents. This is exactly what Dr. Spin was talking about. They're so in fear of the parents that they don't want to punish the kids. They just want to do what makes everybody happy. They want to please everybody. They're scared of their feelings, right? Insane. So Kelly's saying in Indiana, it's legal. Yeah. It's just rarely ever executed. Uh, and we can have a whole separate conversation. And, I, and I've heard arguments. I've heard people making objective arguments that corporal punishment doesn't work, that it's not effective, that there are more effective ways to, to punish. I'm willing to entertain the data on that, like psychological versus corporal punishment. But I think the larger issue is that teachers are afraid to punish kids at all. They're just afraid of punishment and discipline in general, right? They're just too lenient at large. Um, and the tools they view themselves as having are so, so limited, either by policy, procedure, or just general practice. Um, 
And so Jim said, some of my teachers were crazy. If they were harmed, there might have been some dead students. Okay, well, I, I hear you on that one, brother. All right, let's get back into this and let's get into some crazy stuff. Look, I'm sorry this prosecutor worked me up, but I am so pro Second Amendment that the, these these arguments, a lot of them just trigger me, guys. So I apologize, me scusi, but we're going to get back into this bail hearing and see what she has to say and see what the judge has to say about this. So here we go. Uh, it, it's also clear from the facts that he had um, total access to this weapon and that it was it was for him. Uh, so dad second, on the 29th, dad both defendants head. were aware that he was searching ammunition um, on his phone at school. <laughs> Instead of um, reacting to that as a concerned parent and worried about safety, uh, Mrs. Crumbly texted, LOL, <clears throat> just I'm not mad, just next time don't get caught. Um, and then, obviously, on this very tragic day, on the 30th, they were called to the school and about their uh, son's uh, um, drawing, which clearly depict, depicted threats and acts of violence. And instead of disclosing to the school that he had full access to this weapon, they chose not to. They chose not to take their son home. They chose not to tell anybody that he might be dangerous when it was clear and they had every likelihood that, that he was, and instead they left. Um, furthermore, after the active shooting announcement went out, Mrs. Crumbly texted her son, Ethan, don't get, don't do it. And Mr. Crumbly went to his home purposely to search for this weapon because he was afraid his son had the weapon and was in fact shooting people and hurting them, which as we know is exactly what happened. Your Honor, this is a very serious, horrible, terrible murder and shooting, and it has affected the entire community. And these two individuals could have stopped it. And they had every reason to know that he was dangerous and they gave him a weapon and they didn't secure it and they allowed him free access to it. See that? Okay. Furthermore, your honor, uh, the purpose of- See, okay. Here's one thing I'm going to say real quick is, is this duty to secure? Um, uh, that's what I have a problem with here is the duty to secure. I don't think there's a duty to secure. You don't tell me what to do with my guns. Get out of my, get out of my house. Now I store them. Um, now the other stuff about the, whether they knew or didn't know that's going to be where they might be criminally negligent, right? If they knew he was going to go do this, if they had knowledge, yes. What's going to be really important is that counseling session. Now, if that counseling session is recorded, if we have that evidence, like there's like any documentation of that, like video, audio, anything from that counseling session, I don't think there is, but if there was, that'd be, that'd be, crazy, crazy testimony, crazy evidence, but there's going to be a big conflict. Like what was said in that, that, um, in that conference, right. What went down in that conference, how much they know, how much they not know. Right. Um, that will be very, very material for both the liability of the parents, uh, Ethan to a certain extent, although we know he did it right. He's clearly culpable and the school and what's the comparative negligence between all those parties, right. That's going to be material to the civil case. It's also material for their case and their level of negligence. Right, to what level is it the school's negligence and their negligence? So let's continue. So bond is to secure further court appearances. And yesterday, uh, they they were charged with these counts of mans voluntary manslaughter. Uh, now, Your Honor, the the communication between Mrs. Smith and the prosecutor's office was a text message that uh, was sent to me and was um, not replied to. Um, and you know, we don't have an obligation to cooperate, and there are good reasons for that. And I think they, the, the fact that the, the events that played out show the reasons for that. Now, Mrs. Smith, clearly her clients did not give her, tell her the truth because her representation was they wanted to turn themselves in and that they were um, on their way to do that. Um, however, they didn't turn themselves in, and I, we were told they were out of town, except that Yesterday morning, they withdrew uh, four thousand dollars from an ATM in Rochester Hills, uh, very close to the court where they could have turned themselves in with no um, events and no uh, um, efforts on behalf of law, law enforcement. Instead, they fled and they they sought multiple attempts to hide their location and were eventually tracked down after they uh, parked their car somewhere. A witness saw it. And the entire fugitive apprehension team, with multiple other law enforcement agencies, went into a uh, vacant building and searched it from top to bottom. And these two individuals were found locked somewhere in a room hiding. These are not people that we can be assured will return to court 
um, on their own. And then lastly, pursuant to MCR 6.106, we also should consider, or the court should consider, um, whether or not there are members of the community to vouch. There are none here. In fact, there are none here because there are there's not one person in that community that will vouch for these two defendants. So I'm asking that you set a five hundred thousand dollar bond for both defendants. Five hundred. So five five hundred thousand dollar bond. So five hundred thousand dollars. So half a million dollars for each of them. So that's a million uh, growth, a million aggregate. So uh, you know, a million aggregate. So this the, the, is asking for a million aggregate. Uh, and I think she said no surety. Okay. Um, let's, uh, I'd like to hear from the attorneys. Uh, please address bond as it relates to Jennifer Crumbly first, please. So they got to um, go one Honor, by one. The first thing I need to do is to respond to the prosecution's comments about our contact with their office. On Thursday night, I texted Karen McDonald and told her my office was representing the Crumbly's and we and I wanted to speak with her. She did text back and said we could talk first thing Friday morning. First thing Friday morning, I did text Miss McDonald. I also group texted Miss McDonald with Mario Lehman. I also called her office. I talked to her personal secretary and explained who I was, the circumstances, and that I needed to speak with Miss McDonald. Marielle Lehman also called Miss McDonald in the morning. We called the prosecutor's office throughout the day and never got a call back. We were going to make arrangements to have our clients turn themselves in. I was in a trial in circuit court in front of Judge Savin all day yesterday. Miss Lehman was traveling on a plane from Florida up to Michigan. The prosecutor's office, instead of getting back to us in any way, decided to have a press conference and as Ms. McDonald admitted, try to find a way to, uh, to surprise our clients and catch them off guard when it was so unnecessary. And last night and throughout the day, we were in contact with our clients. They, they were scared, they were terrified, they were not at home. They were figuring out what to do, getting finances in order. And the last text messages we had with them and phone calls Marielle Lehman and I had with them, our plan was to drive to the Novi District Court this morning because arraignments were supposed to start at 830 for any county arraignment. And we had plans to meet them at 730 to text the fugitive apprehension team to get to the court by 830 so they could be arraigned first thing. Those were plans we made and solidified, and we did not announce it because unlike the prosecution, we weren't attempting to make this a media, a media spectacle. This case is absolutely the saddest, most tragic, worst case imaginable. There is absolutely no doubt, but our clients were absolutely going to turn themselves in it was just a matter of logistics and all the prosecution had to do was communicate with me about it. And we tried multiple times. All right, that being said, with respect to Ms. Um, Crumbly, she is 43 years old as pretrial services told you. She has been employed as the director of a large um, company, director of marketing. Um, she is a, she grew up in Clarkston Prior to living in Oxford, where they've owned their home since 2015, she lived in Lake Orion. She has never been in serious trouble with the law. She does have a drunk driving conviction back Do from I. when she was in college. Any conviction on Miss Crumbly's record is a misdemeanor and, and is old. Miss um, Crumbly has um, retained my office and Marielle, obviously, she would not have done that had she planned to not turn herself in and fight these charges. I'm quite certain they would not have paid my office money and, and taken those steps if they were not going to fight these charges. When it comes to the seriousness of the offense, when you listen to the prosecution's facts they're presenting, which are incomplete, very incomplete, it does sound like an, an absolutely egregious of wrongdoing on the part of Mr. and Mrs. Crumbly that they that they gave their child a gun and encouraged him to do this. That's just not the case. And Mrs. Crumbly is presumed innocent. 
And I ask this court to know that to note that full discovery has not been available and that the court is only aware of the facts the prosecution has presented, but that gun was actually locked. So when the prosecution is stating that this child had free access to a gun, that is just absolutely not true. That's a big, okay, that's a big one right there. I wasn't, I was gonna let her finish speaking before I step up, but that's actually a massive fact. That's a massive factual contention that really does matter. So if the gun was truly locked up, I mean, they can prove that, that pretty much defeats, that's gonna pretty much defeat a criminal negligence case here. Like that's gonna be real difficult if it was locked up and the kid broke into it. Now, if they gave the kid a key, then okay, that, that's a different story, right? If that fact comes out as well. That's a big one, right? Um, one other thing I'll point out real quick here, uh, and I'll, I'll let it finish uh, first, but you see two competing stories, right? So you're listening to the prosecution paint their story and defense paint their story. I'm not saying one is accurate, one is not. We're going to find out. One may be a complete fabrication, but you're seeing two different stories being woven here, even at the first steps. This is arraignment. This is the first steps in the process. You're already seeing two wildly different stories. So let's finish up with what she's got to say here. And we need an opportunity to fight this case in court and not in the court of public opinion. We need the opportunity to have our clients' constitutional rights to being presumed innocent protected. And this court is going to see um, in the exam in particular that there is far more going on than what this court has been made aware of. And for that reason, Your Honor, I would ask this court to set bond, keeping all of that in mind. Our clients would absolutely be avail themselves to a GPS tether they would absolutely obey all of the conditions listed by pretrial services. So they're agreeing, they're acquiescing to saying we'll be, we'll accept being, we'll accept the pretrial services conditions, which are GPS and tracking and, and you know checking in with pretrial and going to work and allowing them to go to work. We'll allow that, but we're not going to the, the five hundred thousand, the million dollar, you know, aggregate, you know, five hundred k each. That's unreasonable. This case does not warrant a $500,000 bond. I would ask this court, in light of the criminal history, the limited facts um, presented, to order that the bond be set at $50,000 um, or $100,000 if this court believes it needs to be more. Um, our clients mm. are going to fight these charges. Our clients are just as devastated as everyone else. Um, bond has to come from a place of legal soundness, not emotional reaction, which has driven this entire case. And it is emotionally charged. It is emotionally the worst thing I have ever been involved with and seen. There is no doubt it is the worst thing the Crumbleys have ever been involved with and seen. And there is just so much going on here. And we ask the court to set a reasonable bond. Um, any additional comments as it relates to James Crumbly? Yes, Your Honor. Um, James is 45 years old. He has a prior um, conviction from 2004. Again, similar to Jennifer Crumbly, any convictions that he has would have been, um, we believe that they were misdemeanors. He does not have any substance abuse issues. He does have some health issues that require, um, he's diabetic, that require two types of insulin. So, okay, one thing real quick is that they mentioned, which is very interesting, and, and once again, you got to pay attention to this. So they mentioned the DUI for, for uh, Miss Crumbly, but, and, and which is something you would absolutely disclose. Like a, a lot of people have DUIs, like a lot of people you wouldn't expect have DUIs, like well, oh, shit, half the attorneys I know have DUIs or some even basic drug charges. Yes, you can still be an attorney even if you're charged with drug charges. But um, the fact they didn't mention what the misdemeanor was, that is a little material. Like she should have said, if it was a DUI, like, oh, misdemeanor DUI back in the day, right? She just said similar to Miss Crumbly, it's old. So I'm I'm a little bit on the fence of what that is, uh, you know, for James. He was gainfully employed. Um, he's been in, in Michigan since he and Jennifer moved up here several, several years ago. Um, as for the seriousness of the charges, as Ms. Smith has stated, the facts that have, that have been presented by Ms. McDonald and her office have been cherry picked to further her narrative of making an example of Mr. and Mrs. Crumbly, which she very freely said she was doing yesterday during her press conference. Again, to echo what Ms. Smith has said, I personally contacted Ms. McDonald's office to notify Ms. Smith's availability. She chose not to call us back. I was also in communication with law enforcement, as was Ms. Smith. 
They knew that we were planning to bring Mr. and Mrs. Crumbly in. They knew that we were in communication with them, contrary to what was presented in the media. Um, Your Honor, they hired our office on Thursday. They have been, we are prepared to defend this case. They are absolutely taking this case seriously. They are devastated by the events in the Oxford, um, in the Oxford incident. Um, this is not something that's being taken lightly by them or us, Your Honor. I agree with Ms. Smith, $500,000 is not warranted in this case. The charges are very seriously, but as the court is aware, they are allegations at this point. As Ms. Smith has stated, both of our clients are presumed innocent unless they're proven guilty, um, Your Honor. And quite frankly, from what we know, Your Honor, the facts are not what they've been presented to the court and to the public. So I, I, I again echo what Ms. Smith indicated. Our clients are more than happy to um, have a GPS tether, to be on pretrial, pretrial services supervision. I am, re again, requesting a $50,000 or $100,000 bond but Mr. Crumbly, as with Mrs. Crumbly, is not a flight risk. She is not a, he is not a danger to the community. There is no risk that they're going to flee prosecution. They were never fleeing prosecution. I want to make that very clear with the court. We had been in communication with the prosecutor's office and law enforcement and our clients throughout yesterday, Your Honor. They were not fleeing prosecution, contrary to the media reports. Um, so, Your Honor, I'm asking that they have a $50,000 or $100,000 bond with the GPS tether and pretrial services supervision. Governor, may I respond, please? Very, very quickly, please. Yeah, they, Governor, um, okay, well, well, I, I'm going to say that's a little prejudicial. They shouldn't allow the prosecutor to respond here. Um, yeah, yeah, the, and this is this is. I'm going to get into it after the stops, but you know, with with um, the Rittenhouse case, we saw an inherent bias for the prosecution. Like we saw the problems with that, and you're seeing even at every step of the stage here, the prosecution does get certain advantages. And look, I, I mean, it, the the defendants can be culpable, right? And we always feel differently about it based on whether we feel that the people are guilty or innocent. But what I stand for in the rule of law is, hey, let's make it a level playing field. And there are so many instances where the prosecution has an advantage, and this is one where they just allow a rebuttal. It's like, well, you shouldn't get a rebuttal. We're not in like a, you know, a, you know, for example, an opening statement, closing statement situation, right? But there's like an opening and a rebuttal. It's like, no, I, I mean, you should not have that. You had your chance. You said your piece. Let the judge decide. Right. And the judge has said very quick in the judge's defense. But still, it's uh, it's questionable. I agree with Mrs. Smith on one thing. The court hasn't heard all the facts and neither has the public because I have an ethical duty not to release those facts because she is indeed correct. Her client and um, Mr. Crumbly have a, um, an absolute um, we have a burden and they, they these are merely allegations. So I agree. And I just want to point out, um, nobody needs permission. These, these defendants did not need my permission, and they didn't need law enforcement permission to go to the court and turn themselves in, go to the police department, the sheriff's department, and turn themselves in. I agree Mrs. Smith was, was perhaps in trial. She had a break from 1145 to 245. And I can't imagine why they were surprised the, the whole sh country knew that these charges. That's a shitty argument. I mean, sorry, but the prosecutor, that's a shitty argument. Yeah, yeah, you had a lunch break. You should have gone and, and, and handled this over lunch. That's a shitty argument, but whatever. We're coming. And lastly, to suggest that this anyone has somehow using this incident to um, to create press there's a lot of attention here because four children were murdered yes, and seven others were injured. That's true. And that that is on the mind of every single person in this country. So I would ask that you impose the five hundred thousand dollars cash surety on each of the defendants, Your Honor. Thank you. Um, so in terms of bond, the court is required to comply with MCR six point one zero six. The purpose of bond is to ensure that the uh, the defendants appear in court for all necessary court appearances, as well as uh, to take into consideration any risk to public safety. Um, obviously, these charges are very, very serious. There's no question about that. Um, there is a, there's, the court does have some concern about the flight risk along with the public safety, given the circumstances that occurred yesterday and the fact that the defendants did have to be apprehended um, in order to appear for purposes of arraignment. The court did indicate yesterday after the swear to that it would be conducting an arraignment at 4 p.m. Um, and nobody appeared for purposes of that arraignment. Your so Honor, I, if, Your Honor, I may, if you see it. The bond for Jennifer Crumbly at $500,000 cash surety, no 10%. In the event that Jennifer Crumbly is able to post bond, the following conditions will, uh, will be in place. The defendant is not to use or test positive for alcohol, recreational marijuana, or any controlled substances. 
Um, Ms. Crumbly is not to possess or have in her possession any firearms um, or dangerous weapons, shall not have any assaultive behavior toward anyone, must provide a release address upon release to the pretrial services um, representative. The uh, pretrial services representative will be monitoring bond compliance. The defendant upon within 24 hours of release from the Oakland County Jail must submit to and pay for ETG, PBT, or urinalysis. Um, at a facility that's open seven days a week that automatically lab confirms all positives, provides all levels in writing. Um, that would be at the direction of PTF. And verify that in writing upon release from the Oakland County Jail. In the event that the defendant is firmly is able to post a bond, the court is going to require that she have a GPS tether. Um, the GPS tether upon, must be installed upon release um, from the Oakland County Jail. She may be, the GPS tether will have the allowances that she could um, go to work, attend court hearings, medical appointments, and attorney meetings. She must provide work schedule, medical appointments, and any meetings to PTS in advance. Again, that must be installed at the jail before she leaves the jail. As it relates to James Robert Crum Crumbly, the court is setting a $500,000 cash surety no 10% bond. Um, the defendant is not to use or test positive for alcohol, recreational. Okay, so uh, that kind of wraps that up, guys, because I was getting to the end there. Um, so they both essentially, they both got hit with $500,000. Uh, and yes, that was my cursor here. I was, was getting to the end. I just want to make sure that um, they had gone through both the charges. Um, so yeah, they absolutely 100%, um, they absolutely 100% uh, got uh, hit with the maximum penalty. And the judge didn't want to hear it. The judge did not want to hear it at all. She had a... Um, she had a point at which the defense counsel was trying to speak up and they did not even let them interject. So that's one case where, and I've met judges like this, especially um, female judges, um, which have absolutely 100% come down strict like this, have not, uh, have not allowed any, um, have not allowed any talk back, any, any sort of comment from the defense of have been very, very strict. So yeah, it happens a lot of times. Um, and I, I know, I know judges like that. I know a judge that looks exactly like that judge and is just as harsh. Um, and, and once again, it's, it's sad to see, but there's a lot of inherent advantages that the prosecution have, and this is one of them. Um, now the facts are pretty bad in this case. Um, it does look like there was flight here. There's at least the appearance of flight. Now, I think what happens is there's a colorable argument, right? There's an argument here that they weren't actually trying to flee. There's an argument that they were trying to arrange how to, to turn themselves in, which is a whole different scenario. If they were allowed to, uh, if they're trying to arrange to turn themselves in, well, that's much more permissible, right? And it's understandable if there were death threats out there um, or, you know, other threats at these people that they were worried about, right? Um, that is some reason why you might go into hiding. So there's a plausible reason, right? It doesn't necessarily have to be a flight risk. So there's arguments the defense made, which I think were really good. Um, and I think that, uh, I think that they made the best argument they could make at arraignment, right? For being let out light. I was surprised they, I mean, 50,000, a hundred thousand. Okay. That's fine. But 500, that's, that's large, right? That's a very large amount and it's for each of them. So you're talking about a million dollars. So, you know, they've got to come up with a certain percentage of that, um, quite soon, quite soon. Um, Roy says a 18 year old senior in high school allowed to carry, um, you know, that's that, well, is that a question? Because, uh, well, right now, obviously with gun free school zones, it's not permitted, but are you asking me Royce, do you think, do you think that I, that people should be able to carry if they, you know, have that license in school and they're 18 year olds? Yes, actually. I believe in the second amendment enough that I believe that even people who are 18 and in high school should be allowed to carry if they want to carry. Right. I mean, that's how I believe the second amendment should be. I mean, I believe it should be like it was the founding of this country where you want to carry constitutional carry, you know, you should be able to carry when and where you want to carry. Right. Um, I, I'm for expanding those boundaries. I'm not for restricting them. Uh, I'm also against the ability of businesses to post signs that firearms aren't allowed. Um, you know, I think that if it's a place of public accommodation, if it's a place where normally you should be allowed to go, I mean, you should be allowed to 
um, you know, bring your bring your uh, concealed, you know, bring your licensed constitutional, you know, firearm there. I do think there's certain places where it might be inappropriate or why, where the club might be able to allow rules, like, for example, nightclubs or bars, because the high incidence of fighting there, because it's so it's an area where there's so much like fighting that you can show, hey, there's an elevated risk. That's pretty objective. There's data to show that. I'm OK with that. But, you know, going to you know, the grocery store or, you know, anywhere else you normally go, even the bank, right. You should be able to carry, right. I, I that's my, that's my opinion. I'm very pro to a, so a lot of people would disagree with that, but that's my opinion just because I think that we should be expanding, not contracting the second amendment. The school knew he was posting on IG and kids and parents went to uh, the school on top kids didn't even show up because they knew it was going to happen. Yeah. That's uh that's really scary. That's really, really scary. Um, and uh, yeah, it's it's something that that is definitely a material fact that needs to come out and needs to be discussed, because if the school does know and it's shown the school knew, then they are indeed liable. Right. Then they have some part of this liability. That's a slice of liability that's taken away from the parents. Uh, Dr. Spoon says left out. The only time teachers aren't afraid of the parents is when they are in places of and we're in the process of indoctrination. Can't really get into details. Might get Susan for wrong thing. Well, Dr. Spoon, you're not wrong there. Um, but if you want an uncensored place where you can drop your unscripted opinion and you can say whatever the hell you want to say, because uh, that's what we do in my community, uh, go over to my locals community, legalmindset.locals.com. In that community, which right after this, I'm going to be popping into and responding to every single comment that has been made since last week. Uh, and I'm dropping the link right here in the chat. Um, you can say whatever you want to say, and I will not Susan you, and I will post it there privately, and it will not be taken down. But I do appreciate that, and I do know there's lots of indoctrination going on in the schools right now. Um, Swiss, Swiss cigar, 30, uh, 2322 said... Did the judge uh, not say cash, no 10% bond? Uh, yes. So what they're saying is the generally you can get out on 10%, right? By posting like 10%, but they're saying, no, that's not going to apply here, right? So they're going to need to come to a different standard. I think they'll be able to post it large, more than 10%, right? Um, so they'll be able to post more than 10%. So I believe you could post 15 or 20%. I'd have to look into that procedure, but um, yes, you're not going to be able to post 10% in this case. Um, and they did say that specifically. Um so uh, Nordic Nightmare says, mm, I don't agree, sir. We shouldn't let the state raise our children. It's our responsibility to raise them. If they turn out bad, we deserve what we get for raising them bad. Well, I, I think at a certain point, um, at a certain point, you have to take responsibility for your kids. I do agree with that. I do agree with that. Um, and the buck stops at the parents to a certain degree. And we should all be taking responsibility for what's within our control. And to a certain extent, your kids are within the control. The question here, and why I think this is going to be a fascinating case, and I will be following this. One's in the chat. If you guys want me to follow this, want me to follow the, you know, the probable cause here, you want me to follow this case, one's in the chat. If you guys are interested, if you find this interesting, two's in the chat, if you want me to move on to a different topic or this is not the interesting, I just want to see one's in the chat. If you guys enjoyed this, if you enjoyed this format, let me know one's in the chat. This is something different for me. I'm usually not on the Nick Ricada level of watching live video or watching recorded video, um, but just want to see if you guys like this because I'm playing around with my content. You know, my channel is uh, newer and I'm trying to try different things and, you know, do a little experimentation. But it looks like I've seen a lot of ones in the chat. So you guys enjoyed this. So I will be doing more of this. I'll be covering this and I will be following this through. I still love you, Andrew. I respectfully disagree. Hey, Nordic, bro, you're allowed to disagree with me, brother. You're allowed to disagree with me. I, I like disagreement. And that's why I get on the stream with these other lawyers, even though a lot of times they'll disagree with me. They will disagree with me. That's totally cool. That's totally cool. Uh, I'm not always right. I have my opinion. I have my takes. Some people don't like it. When you get me on Fresh and Fit, message Fresh and Fit about it. Um, but look, I'm not going to, I may not be in my Miami timeline is all messed up now because of Omicron. Uh, blame Omicron for my Miami timeline. So I, I thought I was going to come back this month. I don't know whether it's going to happen. We will see. It might be a couple more months because of the stupid rules, because of Joe Biden, because of his rules, because of also visa issues, because of the fear over it. Um, you know, so it may be a delayed timeline, but I will be back in Miami um, within the next six months to eight months for sure. So um, that's that's for sure. So when I go down there, I'll try to hit those guys up. But Omicron is really messing me up, guys. It's really slowing my jam. Um Pizza says, thank you for all you do. No, guys, thank you. And if you guys love me, if you guys like this, smash that like button. It helps me know you guys like this channel, that you love what's going on. If you're in the replay, Gling, drop a comment. Let me know you like this stuff. I appreciate it. I read the comments when I can. And um, Talek says, Bites got Wisco. You need Richards or Sheriff Feasy. Bro, if I get if I get Sheriff Feasy, 
that that Lex Luthor looking motherfucker, that'd be great. He's just a gangster on cross examination. I would just ask him what, how did he learn to be such a gangster? How did he learn to be such a gangster? Uh, someone asked, what are lockdowns like in South Korea? Um, so let me let me tell you, they were rolling back, but you know, just like Japan, which opened up and then reclosed, it's going to be the same sort of here. They were opening up, they were opening up slowly, and then they rolling back. So the restrictions are kind of coming back into place here in South Korea, just because they're very conservative in terms of what's going on with this. Um, and it, it's going to be soon enough that they are requiring the booster shot in order to get in without quarantine, right? Um, they're still requiring quarantine if you don't have your full, if you're not fully vaxxed under in the Korean system. So you actually have to go get juiced in Korea. They don't accept it in America, which I always laugh because people are like, oh, get juiced. You have such privileges. Well, guess what? The new requirements for the United States, they don't care whether you're juiced or not. You can be juiced or unjuiced. You still have to test. Well, what does that tell you about the faith in the juice? Zero. Zero faith in the juice. But that's a whole separate rant, guys. That's a crazy, that's a whole separate crazy world. We're going to get there later. Guys, thank you so much. I'm going to be back tomorrow. We're going to have a stream tomorrow. Also, if you're a part of my locals community, I'm recording a video right after this, like directly after this. So um, look for that. It should be out in the next couple hours. That should be on locals, locals exclusive, responding to everything that's been posted on locals in the last week. So for my community there, look out for that. And otherwise, I will see you guys tomorrow. Peace.